Last time we began trying to, we began by trying to navigate our way through Kant's moral theory. Now, fully to make sense of Kant's moral theory in the groundwork requires that we be able to answer three questions. How can duty and autonomy go together? What's the great dignity in answering to duty? It would seem that these two ideas are opposed, duty and autonomy. What's Kant's answer to that? Need someone here to speak up on Kant's behalf. Does he have an answer? Yes, go ahead, stand up. Kant believes that you only act autonomously when you, are, uh, when you are pursuing something only in the name of duty and not because of your own circumstances, such as, like, you're, you're only doing something good and moral if you're doing it because of duty and not because of something of your own personal gain. Now, why is that acting, what's your name? My name is Matt. Matt, why is that acting out of freedom? I, I hear what you, you're saying you about you choose duty. to accept those moral laws in yourself and they're not brought on from outside upon onto okay, you. Okay, good. Because acting out of duty yeah. is following a moral law that you impose on yourself. That you impose on yourself. That's what makes duty compatible with freedom. Yeah. Okay, that's good, Matt. That is Kant's answer. That's great. Thank you. So, Kant's answer is it is not insofar as I am subject to the law that I have dignity, but rather insofar as, with regard to that very same law, I'm the author, and I'm subordinated to that law on that grounds that I took it, as Matt just said, I took it upon myself. I willed that law. So that's why, for Kant, acting according to duty and acting freely, in the sense of autonomously, are one and the same. But that raises the question, how many moral laws are there? Because if dignity consists in being governed by a law that I give myself, what's to guarantee that my conscience will be the same as your conscience? Who has Kant's answer to that? Yes? Because a moral law is not contingent upon subjective conditions, it would transcend all particular differences between people, and so would be a universal law. And in this respect, there would only be one moral law, because it would be right. supreme. That's exactly right. What's your name? Kelly. Kelly. So Kelly, Kant believes that if we choose freely, out of our own consciences, the moral law, we're guaranteed to come up with one and the same moral law. Yes. And that's because when I choose, it's not me, Michael Sandel, choosing. It's not you, Kelly, choosing for yourself. What is it exactly? Who's doing the choosing? Who's the subject? Who's the agent who's doing the choosing? Reason. Well, well reason. Pure, pure reason. Pure reason. reason. And what you mean by pure reason is what exactly? Well, pure reason is like we were saying before, not subject to any external um, conditions that may be imposed on it. Good. So. That's great. So the reason that does the willing, the reason that governs my will, when I will the moral law, is the same reason that operates when you choose the moral law for yourself. Yes. And that's why it's possible to act autonomously to choose for myself, for each of us to choose for ourselves as autonomous beings, and for all of us to wind up willing the same moral law, the categorical imperative. But then there is one big and very difficult question left. Even if you accept everything that Matt and Kelly have said so far, how is a categorical imperative possible? How is morality possible? To answer that question, Kant says we need to make a distinction. We need to make a distinction between two standpoints. Two standpoints from which 
we can make sense of our experience. Let me try to explain what he means by these two standpoints. As an object of experience, I belong to the sensible world. There, my actions are determined by the laws of nature and by the regularities of cause and effect. But as a subject of experience, I inhabit an intelligible world. Here, being independent of the laws of nature, I am capable of autonomy, capable of acting according to a law I give myself. Now Kant says that only from this second standpoint can I regard myself as free, for to be independent of determination by causes in the sensible world is to be free. If I were wholly an empirical being, as the utilitarians assume, if I were a being wholly and only subject to the deliverances of my senses, to pain and pleasure and hunger and thirst and appetite, if that's all there were to humanity, we wouldn't be capable of freedom, Kant reasons. Because in that case, every exercise of will would be conditioned by the desire for some object. In that case, all choice would be heteronymous choice governed by the pursuit of some external end. When we think of ourselves as free, Kant writes, we transfer ourselves into the intelligible world as members and recognize the autonomy of the will. That's the idea of the two standpoints. So how are categorical imperatives possible? Only because the idea of freedom makes me a member of an intelligible world. Now, Kant admits we aren't only rational beings. We don't only inhabit the intelligible world, the realm of freedom. If we did, if we did, then all of our actions would invariably accord with the autonomy of the will. But precisely because we inhabit simultaneously the two standpoints, the two realms, the realm of freedom and the realm of necessity, precisely because we inhabit both realms, there is always potentially a gap between what we do and what we ought to do between is and ought. Another way of putting this point, and this is the point with which Kant concludes the groundwork, morality is not empirical. Whatever you see in the world, whatever you discover through science, can't decide moral questions. Morality stands at a certain distance from the world, from the empirical world. And that's why no science could deliver moral truth. Now, I want to test Kant's moral theory with the hardest possible case, a case that he raises, the case of the murderer at the door. Kant says that lying is wrong. We all know that. We've discussed why. Lying is at odds with the categorical imperative. A French philosopher, Benjamin Constant, wrote an article responding to the groundwork where he said, this absolute prohibition on lying is wrong. It can't be right. What if a murderer came to your door looking for your friend who was hiding in your house? And the murderer asked you, point blank, is your friend in your house? Constant says it would be crazy to say that the moral thing to do in that case is to tell the truth. Constant says the murderer 
certainly doesn't deserve the truth. And Kant wrote a reply. And Kant stuck by his principle that lying even to the murderer at the door is wrong. And the reason it's wrong, he said, is once you start taking consequences into account to carve out exceptions to the categorical imperative, you've given up the whole moral framework. You've become a consequentialist or maybe a rule utilitarian. But most of you and most of Kant's readers think there's something odd and implausible about this answer. I would like to try to defend Kant on this point. And then I want to see whether you think that my defense is plausible. And I would want to defend him within the spirit of his own account of morality. Imagine that someone comes to your door. You were asked the question by this murder. You're hiding your friend. Is there a way that you could avoid telling a lie without selling out your friend? Does anyone have an idea of how you might be able to do that? Yes, stand up. I was just going to say if I were to let my friend in my house to hide in the first place, I'd probably make a plan with them. So I'd be like, hey, I'll tell the murderer you're here, but escape. And <laughs> that's one of the options mentioned. So. But I'm not sure that's a Kantian option. Hmm? You're still lying, though. No, because he's in the house, but he won't be. Oh, I see. <laughs> All right, good enough. One more try. If you just say you don't know where he is because he might not be locked in the closet, he might have left the closet, you have no clue where he could be. <laughs> so you would say, I don't know, which wouldn't actually be a lie because you weren't at that very moment looking in the closet. Exactly. <laughs> so it would be, strictly speaking, true. Yes and yet possibly deceiving, misleading. But still true. <laughs> <laughs> What's your name? John. John. All right, John has, uh, now John may be on to something. John, you're really offering us the option of a clever evasion that is strictly speaking true. This raises the question whether there is a moral difference between an outright lie and a misleading truth. From Kant's point of view, there actually is a world of difference between a lie and a misleading truth. Why is that? Even though both might have the same consequences. But then remember, Kant doesn't base morality on consequences. He bases it on formal adherence to the moral law. Now, sometimes in ordinary life, we make exceptions for the general rule against lying with a white lie. What is a white lie? It's, it's a lie to make, well, to avoid hurting someone's feelings, for example. It's a lie that we think of as justified by the consequences. Now, Kant could not endorse a white lie, but perhaps he could endorse a misleading truth. Suppose someone gives you a tie as a gift, and you open the box, and it's just awful. <laughs> what do you say? Thank you. Thank you? You could say thank you. But they're waiting to see what you think of it. Or they ask you, what do you think of it? You could tell a white lie and say, it's beautiful. But that wouldn't be permissible from Kant's point of view. Could you say, not a white lie, but a misleading truth? You open the box and you say, I've never seen a tie like that before. <laughs> Thank you. You shouldn't have. <laughs> That's good.
Can you think of a contemporary political leader who engaged? <laughs> you can. Who are you thinking of? Remember the whole carefully worded denials in the Monica Lewinsky affair of Bill Clinton. Now, those denials actually became the subject of very explicit debate and argument during the impeachment hearings. Take a look at the following excerpts from Bill Clinton. Is there something, do you think, morally at stake in the distinction between a lie and a misleading, carefully couched truth? I want to say one thing to the American people. I want you to listen to me. I'm going to say this again. I did not have sexual relations with that woman, Miss Lewinsky. I never told anybody to lie, not a single time, never. These allegations are false. Did he lie to the American people when he said, I never had sex with that woman? You, you know, he, he doesn't believe he did, and because of the... What, the let me explain, may I explain, Congressman? What he said was to the American people that he did not have sexual relations. And I understand you're not going to like this, Congressman, because it, you will see it as a, a hair-splitting, evasive answer. But in his own mind, his Wait, definition was not... Okay, I understand that argument. Okay. <laughs> All right. So there you have the exchange. Now, at the time, you may have thought this was just a legalistic, hair-splitting exchange between a Republican who wanted to impeach Clinton and the lawyer who was trying to defend him. But now, in the light of Kant, do you think there is something morally at stake in the distinction between a lie and an evasion, a true but misleading statement? I'd like to hear from <coughs> defenders of Kant, people who think there is a distinction. Are you, are you ready to defend Kant? Well, I think when you try to say that lying and misleading truths are the same thing, you're basing it on a consequentialist argument, which is that they achieve the same thing. But the fact of the matter is, you told the truth, and you intended that people would believe what you were saying, which was the truth, which means it is not morally the same as telling a lie and intending that they believe it is the truth, even though it's not true. Good. What's your name? Diana. So Diana says there is, that Kant has a point here. And it's a point that might even come to the aid of Bill Clinton. And that is, well, what about that? Someone over here. For Kant, motivation is key. So if you give to someone because primarily you want to feel good about yourself, Kant would say that has no moral worth. Well, with this, the motivation is the same. It's to sort of mislead someone. It's to lie. It's to sort of throw them off the track. And the motivation is the same. So there should be no difference. Okay, good. So here, isn't the motive, motive the same, Diana? What, what do you say to this argument that, well, the motive is the same. In both cases, there is the attempt, or at least the hope, that one's pursuer will be misled. Uh, well, that, you could look at it that way, but I think that the fact is that your immediate motive is that they should believe you. The ultimate consequence of that is that they might be deceived and not find out what was going on. But the, your immediate motive is that they should believe you because you're telling the truth. May I help a little? Sure. You and Kant. Why don't you say, and what's your name? I'm sorry. What? Why don't you say to Wesley, it's not exactly the case that the motive in both cases is to mislead. They're hoping, they're hoping that the person will be misled by the statement I don't know where they are, or I never had sexual relations. You're hoping that they will be misled, but in the case where you're telling the truth, your motive is to mislead while at the same time telling the truth and honoring the moral law and staying within the bounds of the categorical imperative. I think Kant's answer would be, Diana, yes? yes. You like that? I do. Okay, so I think Kant's answer would be, 
Unlike a falsehood, unlike a lie, a misleading truth pays a certain homage to duty. And the homage it pays to duty is what justifies that the work of even the work of evasion. Diana. Yes? You like? Okay. And so there is something, some element of respect for the dignity of the moral law in the careful evasion. Because Clinton could have told an outright lie, but he didn't. And so I think Kant's, Kant's insight here is in the carefully couched but true evasion, there is a kind of homage to the dignity of the moral law that is not present in the outright lie. And that, Wesley, is part of the motive. It's part of the motive. Yes, I hope he will be misled. I hope the murderer will run down the road or go to the mall looking for my friend instead of the closet. I hope that will be the effect. I can't control that. I can't control the consequences. But what I can control is standing by and honoring however I pursue the ends I hope will unfold to do so in a way that is consistent with respect for the moral law. Wesley, I don't think, is entirely persuaded. But at least this brings out, this discussion brings out, some of what's at stake, what's morally at stake in Kant's notion of the categorical imperative.